the things that we tend to think we're fighting about or fighting with is not really there. We're not really fighting against um, the, 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 our spouse or our kids or the waiter at the restaurant or even the girl at the checkout or even um, <clears throat> the people on, on social media. We're not even fighting against our government. Um, and right now in our, in, in our culture, in our world, we think that all of these things are the fights that we're dealing with, and that's not what we're fighting against. In the very first beginning of this, we talked about the idea that we're actually fighting against the mindset of Satan. Um, as soon as sin entered into the world in the Garden of Eden, what started this whole process of this downward spiral for humanity was a mindset that Satan brought with him into the Garden of Eden. Um, when he tempted Eve to, to take the fruit and then to eat it and then her giving it to Adam, it was changing the mindset from what they knew to be true about God and who he was into something that was completely different and skewed. And in order for us to actually be able to win this fight, we have to start fighting the right way and fighting in, with the right tools and the right weapon. Um, and we have to be able to be in that place where when we see those things happen, we're quick on the draw to put them into practice. The first week we talked about um, that we've got to be prompt to hear. We looked at a passage of scripture um, that says everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Well, if you're quick to listen, you automatically become slow to speak and slow to become angry. Because what we have got to figure out how to do is to be prompt to hear, not just to hear, but to be prompt to hear with an intent to learn and put into practice what we've just learned. And we walked away from the first week by saying that in order for us to do this, it means that we have to seek first to understand and then to be understood. Because if we're quick to listen, it makes it easier for us to understand where people are coming from. And it makes it easier for us then to turn around and be understood because we actually understand the situation that's happening around us. Last week, we jumped into this idea that we tend to, as human beings, and we can't help it because we're created selfish, is this idea that we start to compare ourselves to other people. And it doesn't matter if it's, like we talked about last week, if it's another mom, if it's, another, if it's a celebrity, maybe even just a normal person in your, in your life. Maybe there's someone that you know personally that has something you wish you had. Or maybe it's a mom that you wish that you could be like that mom or dads. Maybe you wish that you were that kind of dad. We compare ourselves to every single person. And all that does is start to drive something into place that moves us further and further and further away from where God wants us to be. That's what the problem was in the garden. Because Satan planted a seed there that made Adam and Eve think that they were not made in the image of God. And it moved them to a place where they ended up falling and causing everything that we're in now. And so we walked away by saying that we have to be quick to understand and, re and realize that God already gave us everything that we need. Everything that he created us for, the purpose that he created us for, like we talked about several weeks ago. Uh, you know, when we were created, we were created with a purpose and with a mission that we were supposed to fulfill on this earth. Well, when God created us and God started gifting us, he gifted us every single thing that we would need to be able to live out that purpose, which is why it's so dangerous for us to compare each other to other people. Now, as we bring this down, I want to, I want to set the stage for why this last week is so important for me, okay? Everything that we talk about in here, and I want to make sure you guys understand this, everything that I bring in here to you guys is not something that I've just pulled out of my back pocket and that I have put in place, and I've got it in a file cabinet somewhere. These are topics, these are things that as I'm praying for the life of the church, and as I'm praying for myself personally even, that God says, here are the things that I need and that I want believers to understand. And I want them to know. So as I was praying through this and started going through this, I was put into a scenario where I had to really think through this Raquel a lot of times will say, I wish you would quit preaching on certain things because anything that you preach on, we tend to have to live through. The good, the bad, and, and the ugly, and all the in-between. And she's like, can you just maybe spend some time preaching on abundance and blessings and all the good things that God has for us? And I was like, well, yeah, but this is what God's telling me to preach on. So I ended up, I found myself in a scenario where I had to really do some soul searching and, and really digging in because... In all of the conversations that Raquel and I have had, and I hope these are conversations that you've had with, with your spouse, and, or maybe one day we'll have with your spouse, but it needs to be a conversation that you start having now, whether you're married, whether you're single, whether you're still a child and are looking to the future of getting married. 
But the reality is this. I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave a legacy. And when I say I want to, to leave a legacy, I have a very specific hope for my legacy. I don't, I don't want to necessarily leave a legacy of wealth. I don't necessarily want to leave a legacy of, of stuff. I don't necessarily want to be able to, when my life ends, for my children to be necessarily set up for the rest of their lives. That's not, those kind of things are not necessarily important to me. I realize that those are important to a lot of people, but... I have a very specific hope for my legacy because I want my kids to remember me a certain way. When they look back on their life growing up with me and even as adults while I'm still on this earth, I want them to look back and remember me a certain way. God forbid that, I get, that God chooses to take me home without my wife. I want my wife to remember me a certain way. I want her to look back on her marriage with me and the relationship that we had and I want her to remember me a specific way. I want the people that I come in contact with, that I've been a part of their story, I want you guys to be able to look back at me and remember me a certain way. I want to be the kind of person that is remembered as a man of integrity and a man of character. Because when everything is said and done, those are the things that will last. Those are the things that in the end of our world, at the end of our lives, when we breathe our last breath and you either open your eyes and you see the Savior face to face or you open your eyes and you see something infinitely worse. Those are the two things that carry through everything that we do in life. Our integrity and our character. You say, well, Tim, why in the world are you going into something like this today? If we're talking about Winning fights and battles, what in the world does this have to do with anything? Well, the reality is, every single one of us, whether you're watching online or whether you're in this room, you have the same desire. We all want to be remembered in a way that people will look at us fondly, and they will remember good things about us, and hopefully they'll remember the moments where where their lives maybe were changed. We want people to have good memories of us. We want them to think well of us at the end of our lives. And this is where the battle picks up. This is where the fight happens. Because if we're fighting against the mindset of Satan, we have to understand that this battle is something that we absolutely every single day fight. It is a battle that as soon as we wake up in the morning and we open our eyes, that the fight has started in, in um, Romans chapter 7, Paul lays this out so beautifully, and I have, I've used this passage of Scripture over and over and over again, and, and I just I come back to it because this is me. This is you. Romans chapter 7, uh, starting in verse 15, Paul is writing to the church um, there in Rome, and he says, I do not understand my own actions. I don't understand because I don't do what I want to do. But instead, I do the very thing that I hate. Hang on right there for just a second for me, Jordan. So he opens up, starting off with this battle right off the front, right off the get-go with this. He says, I don't understand my actions because I want to leave a legacy. I want to leave people with something that changes things. I want to leave them with something that, that makes sense. He says, it's the things that I don't want to do that I end up doing, but it's the things that I do want to do that I don't end up doing. Right off the very bat, he says, he says, now if I do what I don't want, I agree with the law that is, that is good. So, so now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. He says, I, I'm sin I, I want you guys to understand there is a sinful nature that is inside of me. Even though I am a follower of Jesus, there is still a sinful nature inside of me. Even though I have seen Jesus face to face and he blinded me and he took those, that blinder off of me and I saw him face to face, I still have this sinful nature inside of me because there are things that I don't want to do that I still end up doing. And it's the things that I really want to do that I end up not doing. He says, I, because I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. He says, I know that inside of me, in my flesh, there is nothing good that can come out of this. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. 
Every single day I face this conundrum of wanting to do these things but not having the ability to do it out because of the sinful nature that lives inside of me. He says, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I don't want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. I love the fact that he says this over and over and over again. Because we have this argument, he says this later in the New Testament, he says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Okay, so let's clarify this. He says, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. If you have taken yourself and allowed yourself to be grafted in to the one true vine that Jesus talks about, then you are a new creation and you will begin to bear fruit there. But he still makes it a point to say over and over and over again, I don't do the good I want, but the evil I do not want to do is what I keep doing. If I keep doing that, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. He makes it abundantly clear we are human beings. And this desire to do what I want to do but not being able to do it just means that I am human. Why? Because our nature, from the very moment that we're born, is sinful. The very thing inside of us, like I talked about last week, the thing that is inside of us from the moment we're born is nothing but sin all the time. We're born selfish. We're born wanting everything else. Our flesh is that thing inside of us that says, I've got this. And as soon as that happens, we come back to the flesh and the sinful nature begins to take control. Why? Because our flesh is deceitful. The fleshly side of us will lie to you every single time. Every single one of us reaches a point in our life where we think we've got it under control. And this is why it is so undeniably important for us to understand what is happening inside of us from the moment that we ask Jesus into our lives. Because if we all want to leave a legacy, we all want to leave something that the world behind us that comes after us is changed. And for those of us with children and young children, when we look at them, we say, I want to leave a different legacy for them than what I came up with. Then we have to understand what the difference between this mindset of Satan and the mindset of Christ and where that comes from. And when we start taking a look at it, we have, to send, we have to take that mindset of Satan and change it and switch it. We already know that our fight is not against flesh and blood. Paul is abundantly clear about it. It's against the powers that rule this world. It's against the mindset of Satan. Since the fall, we are born with this sinful nature. In fact, so much so, and we know that's the case because Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Which means that what we are born with has to be changed. And this is why it's so important to understand the difference between integrity and character. We tend to use them interchangeably. A man of high integrity has high character. That's not necessarily true. We also tend to say a person with low integrity is a person without character. That's not necessarily true. Because there is a vast difference between the two. They are completely connected because someone with a high in integrity, someone who has a high in integrity inside of them, will be more likely to have a strong character about them and vice versa. But here's the difference. Integrity comes from who you are at your core. Integrity is the thing that's way inside of you that nobody can see. It is the part inside of you that is ruled by your core values and your core beliefs. Your character is what's lived out in front of people over the course of rep through repetition. You can have solid integrity. You can have the highest level of integrity in your life. But if you don't exercise good, good strong character in front of people, then it will hinder what they see. Character is the thing that comes out of us through repetition. This is a concept that we see Jesus actually teaching his disciples before he's arrested and crucified. When Jesus is talking to his followers um, in Luke chapter 9, they're sitting in the upper room and, and he's teaching. 
And in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 23, he says to all of them, every single person there, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Jesus looks at his followers. He says, listen, once you believe in me, once you start following me, you come to that place that I told Nicodemus about where you are now born again. The old is gone, the new remains, but you're still in this battle. You're still going to have this fight. And if you want to come after me and follow me in the teachings that I've laid out, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to deny the sinful nature that is born inside of you. You're going to have to deny all of that fight that's happening around you and daily take up your cross and follow me. It's not something that you, that just, you, you lay your life at the foot of the cross and you say, okay, Jesus, I absolutely believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you are the Holy Son of God, born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, who was crucified, dead, and buried. And because you and the Father are one, the life was breathed back into you three days later and you rose from the dead. Not just for the sins of the entire world, but for my sins to be wiped away. See, this is part of the problem. We tend to put an umbrella over Jesus' sacrifice. And when you put an umbrella over the sacrifice of Jesus, it loses the impact on your life. You stop seeing how important that umbrella is for you. Things got real quiet there. This is why it's so important to daily remind yourself of who Jesus is and what the sacrifice is and what his teachings are. It's not something you do once. It's something you do over and over and over and over again. It's the same concept as training yourself to do something. How many of you, when you started a new job and you had to learn how to do something, did it once and then just had it perfect from there on out? How many of you, when you went to school, you, you took one concept and you started learning it and you did it one time in class, got it right, and then had it perfect from then on out? The odds are not very often. How many of you have ever played a sport and you took to that sport and you started playing and then you just never went to a practice and then went to the games and were the best player on the field? Not very many of us. How many of you picked up an instrument and started playing and it could immediately play it like a master? Not very many of you. Not very many of me. There's only one of me. How many of you, when you became a parent, were the perfect parent right off the bat? How many of you, when you became a husband or a wife, had it perfect right off the bat? None of us. It took effort. It took work. It took repetition of, 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 of hearing your wife or your husband say, listen, I need you to do this. It took time for you to grasp that. It took time for you even, I mean, this is the same thing that we do with our children. When our children are born and we start to, to, start to shape them and mold them and we start teaching them, it's the same concept that that Solomon wrote about in the book of Proverbs, train up a child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it. Why? Because you repetitively taught them. You repetitively laid foundation. The things that they knew were wrong, they knew were wrong because they made the same mistake over and over and over. And you were consistent with your correction. You were consistent with your discipline. I have, you know, Raquel and I doing student ministry for well over 20 years. We have to parents all the time that come in and they'll say, I need you to fix my kid. I can't fix your kid. I can make them one way here, but if you're not doing something here at home, nothing changes. People come to me as a pastor and say, I need you to fix my husband or my wife. And I say, I can't fix your husband or wife. 
because it takes repetitive consistency at home between the two of you trying to do the same thing with the same goal in mind. If you don't do that, nothing happens. You have to train each other. Husbands, you have to train your wife what it looks like to be the kind of wife that you know God needs you to, needs for her. But you also need to be training yourself through what you know that the Father has said you need to be as a husband. And wives, the same is true for you. You should be repetitively being able to let your husband see what you need from him in order for him to love you the way that Christ loves the church. But you also need to be seeking the Father in the same way that you expect your husband to be doing it. So that you can leave the sort of legacy that you want as a husband or a wife and as a father and a mother and as a friend. Because if you're not training yourself, taking up your cross daily, you will always miss the mark. This is something that Paul even encouraged Timothy with. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 12, he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Okay, Here we go, talking about this fight that there is, this battle that's going to happen. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, it kind of sounds like where we're at in our culture now. It says, but as for you, continue, continue, consistently keep moving forward. That's what continue means. It means to move forward with consistency in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul tells Timothy, look back on what got you to where you are. Those things that have brought you to that place where right now you have a strong character in front of everybody, the integrity that you have built into you through the word of God that you have placed and that your parents and your, your mother, your grandmother have, have taught and laid into your life that have become part of who you are. Continue in that. Be consistent in that. And then he took it a step further. He said, all scripture is good for all of these things. It's profitable for teaching. It's to, the, to take it and show it to those who need to know what you know. Scripture is good for teaching. It's good for reproof. It's good for pushing back against the mindset of Satan. And it's also good for correction. When you have to push back where you can show the error that's there and help correct. But you can't do those things unless you have used it for training in righteousness. Because there is none righteous except him. Because our righteousness is like filthy rags. And unless we consistently allow the word of God to come into our lives and take root where we are, nothing will change. Paul takes this same thing, he says, if you want to be remembered as righteous, if you want to be able to have strong character, you have to train yourself through Scripture. This is the same idea that was laid out by Solomon in the Old Testament and by David, his father. David says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. So that when people see me, they will see a man of godly character. We say, well, now, wait a minute. Isn't that the same David that, yes. But how do we remember him? We remember him through his nickname, a man after God's own heart. Because David allowed the word of God to so penetrate who he was that it changed the way that he lived. So much so that his son Solomon came after him and said, you know what? If you will train a child, if you will be consistent in teaching them the scriptures, if you will do what you were commanded to do in the book of Deuteronomy and you will daily speak of the teachings of God, they will be on your lips and you will put them over your doorpost. 
When you sit down, you talk about it. When you rise, you talk about it. If you do all of those things, your child will not depart from it. Why? Because training happens through example. Whatever is important to you will be important to your children. And vice versa, whatever is not important to you, nine times out of ten will not be important to you. Kids. If reading the Bible is not important to you, it will never be important to your children until the Holy Spirit corrects them. But it should never get to that point. If going to church is not important to you, if being together with believers is not important to you, guess what? It's not going to be important to your kids. We have to change those processes in order to do that. Why? Because consistency paves the way to the destination. Think about it in terms of taking a road trip. If you know you want to get from here to Atlanta, if you get on the interstate and you keep going in the same direction, you keep going that way, you're going to hit Atlanta. But if you get on the interstate and you keep going 10 miles and then turning around and driving south 10 miles and turning back around and going 10 miles and making a loop, you're not going to get anywhere. You have to break that cycle. If you want to leave a legacy of, that's one that people look at you and they remember you for having a strong, godly integrity and character about you, then you have to take up your cross daily and deny yourself. You have to be repetitive in the things that you do. If you only do what you've always done, you'll get the same result. See, true learning only comes from repetition. You have to do something multiple times in order for you to actually learn what it is. That's why we call it studying. Because when you read something and you pull it apart and you tear it apart and you come back and you look at it and you pull it apart again, you do it over and over and over, eventually it becomes part of your core. It becomes part of who you are. That's why a lot of times your te a teacher will say, will have uh, student projects and they'll say, I want you to come up and teach us to do something. Because the best way to know whether or not you know something is to prepare to teach somebody else. best way to do that is through consistency and repetition. In order to make something a habit, it has to be done through repetition. Those of you who pick at your nails, you know why you do it? Because you've done it over and over and over until it became a habit. Those of you who are addicts, do you know why you're an addict? Because you did it over and over again. Those of you who leave notes for your husband, do you know why you do it? Because you did it over and over again, and it became a habit. Those of you who shut out your spouse, do you know why you do it? Because you've done it over and over again. Kids, do you know why you lie to your parents from time to time? Because you've done it over and over and over again. If we know there's a certain place we want to get to, it's going to take repetition to get there. You cannot change the inside. You cannot change your core beliefs without consistency and repetition and being in the Word of God and being with the people of God. There's no way to get there without it. Because our core beliefs will always drive where we go. And until we put consistency into place to make sure that our core beliefs are focused in the right direction, in a belief that Jesus is who he says he is, and that his words can lay a better foundation for us than anything else, nothing will change. We absolutely can have the legacy that we want. Sitting in this room right now, whatever that legacy looks like for you, if you want a legacy where people see you and they are remembered you, remember they remember you for your generosity, 
or they remember you for your compassion. They remember you for the love that you showed them. They remember you for being the one who would sacrifice for people. If that's the legacy you want, if you want a legacy, uh, to leave a legacy of, of being a father who is always there for their children, that their children will look back and remember how much dad loved them and how much dad taught them. Moms, if you want to be the kind of mom that you, your kids look back on and go, man, my mom was praying for me all the time. You can have that but it takes consistency. It takes consistently coming back to the things that you know need to be in place for you to be able to win the fight that you are in. You have to daily come back. You have to daily, every minute when your eyes open up, as soon as they open up in the morning, you have to start. You have to start every single day by understanding first that your legacy can only begin when you've been born again. The type of legacy you want to live can only be had if you are born again. And because you've been born again, that everything that you need for that legacy has already been given to you. And that one of the first steps towards living that legacy is to be quick to understand and then to be understood. Because if you seek first to understand, you will always love people the way that Christ loved the church. This is so vitally important. And yet we don't talk about it much in our churches. We say, read your Bible, go to church, go to this, go to that, do this, do that. But we never talk about the why behind it. If you can create a habit of reading the Word of God, and when I say reading the Word of God, I'm talking about the embodiment of God. Read the words and the teachings of Jesus. That's who we're supposed to be modeling anyway. Say, so, well, there's so much written by Paul. Yes, but Paul walked, he knew Jesus. He was there. He heard the teachings. He was an eyewitness to the teachings of Jesus. You can trust his words too because he echoed what Jesus taught. You've got to lay consistency into the word and you've got to lay consistency into building people into your life who are also consistently in the word so that you can be consistent in those relationships, so that when you have a problem, you know that there are people there who love you and can be there with you, that can give you godly wisdom and advice. Don't try to do it on your own. For some of you, you're like, oh, man, I'm already doing that. Are you, though? Are you? Because we all have things in our world, in our lives, that pull us away from this. And what happens is when it does it once, it's not too bad. When it does it twice, eh, you're starting to find trouble. Third time's a charm. If you break consistently at least three times, you will never regain it. That's why so many of you that are watching online right now aren't here. Because you broke consistency. That's why so many of you that are watching online or that are here in this room, you don't read your Bible. Because you broke consistency. It doesn't make you a bad person. Look at Paul. Paul said, look, I don't need, the things I want to do, I don't do. I do the things I don't want to do. It just makes you human makes you in need of a savior. Some of you are sitting in this room and you say, well, okay, if the first step is that I need to be born again, I don't even know what that looks like. It's simple. Acknowledge the fact that you were born a sinner with a sinful nature. And that's just a big church word that says that you were born with something inside of you that predisposes you to live against the will of God that puts you in need of a savior. 
And once you reach that point, then you have to reach that place where you say, you know what, I've heard about this Jesus guy. And I think I actually do believe that he is who he said he was, that he was the son of God made flesh to live on this world, to one day take on my sins on the cross, to be crucified, to make a way back to the Father. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and three days later, he rose from the dead, conquering death and sin forever. And once you reach that place, see, belief isn't just a head belief. Belief means that it takes on a whole new perspective. It changes how you live your life. True belief requires action. So once you reach that place where you believe that Jesus is exactly who he says he is, then you have to daily commit yourself to taking up your cross, denying the sinful part of who you are, and allowing him through consistency to replace all of those things and walking with him. How do you do that? It's not as scary as you think. If you're in that place and you've reached that place where you say, you know what, I know I'm a sinner and I know that I need, that I need Jesus. In just a second, I'm going to be hanging out down here on this front pew. Come and talk to me. I will answer any question you have. And if, you, if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know the answer, but let's figure it out together. If you don't have any questions, then I will look at you and I will pray with you. There's nothing magical about a prayer, but I will pray with you and help you walk right up to the foot of the cross and meet the Savior face to face. Because until we surrender everything about our sinful nature to him to be reborn, nothing changes. And you will never be able to leave the legacy that you want to. So in just a minute, when Blake comes and we sing the last song, if that's you, come talk to me. Father, thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for loving us. I thank you that you want so much more for us than for us to just exist. God, I pray that in these next few moments, that you will help us to surrender every single bit of who we are to you and to start living consistently, denying ourselves daily and taking up the cross. Father, if there's anyone in this room that doesn't know you or even anyone watching online, I pray that you would draw them into you. Pull them in, wrap your arms around them, and let them see how much you love them. Help them to see that that's the starting point. Father, thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray.